Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, it's local election day in Korea. Polling stations will stay open for the next 12 hours. The results are expected to begin coming out later this evening. The commander of US forces in Korea recommends deploying an advanced American missile defense system to South Korea. Plus, Samsung Everland will seek an initial public offering early next year, spurring moves to restructure the family-run Samsung Group ahead of a generational ownership succession. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, June 4th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. It's local election day here in Korea. Polling stations around the nation opened within the last couple of minutes and will remain open for the next 12 hours. Voters are casting their ballots for the over 3,900 district and provincial governor, councillor and education chief posts up for grabs. Our Song Jisun is standing by at a polling station in Seoul's central Jongno-gu district. Jisun, the polls have just opened. Are people already trickling in to make their selections? Well, Mark, the polling stations across the nation have opened their doors just minutes ago at 6 a.m. And officials from the district office and the National Election Committee has been making sure that everything is set up according to protocol. Now, it's still very early in the morning, but we've seen a lot of people outside the door waiting for the voting to start to become the first voters to enter the polling station. Now, the turnout rate will continue to rise as we head into the afternoon, but one thing to keep in mind is that unlike the early voting period, the voters where voters could vote at any polling station anywhere in the nation, today the voters must head to designated polling center assigned to them according to their home mailing addresses. It's been especially hard to predict how the races will turn out this time around with the adoption of the early voting period and factoring in the impacts of the Seoul ferry disaster. Here in Seoul, the ratio of those in their 20s and 30s are the highest in the nation at 39.7 percent, slightly outnumbering those in their 50s and older, standing at 39.6 percent. The young vote was also the highest during the early election accounting for nearly 16 percent of the total 11.5 percent early turnout. Younger generations are usually considered progressive, while the elderly are more conservative. So voting numbers between these two groups will be one of the deciding factors in whether incumbent Mayor Park won soon of the opposition party will continue at his post or the ruling Henry Party's multi-term lawmaker Chong mong -jun, will beat the odds. I'm Song ji reporting live from Chungnogu district in Seoul. Still looks pretty empty, but I'm sure it'll pick up during the morning. Now, just outside of Seoul, there's a region that's getting a lot of attention this year, not only because of its location and huge population, but also for the tight race there as well. Now, for more on this, we have our Connie Lee standing by at a polling station in Gyeonggi-do province. Connie. Good morning, Mark. I'm reporting live to you from a polling station just outside of Seoul in the city of Suwon in Gyeonggi-do province. Now, like Jisun mentioned, polls have just opened, and here citizens are voting for governor of Gyeonggi-do. Now, it's been a few minutes since, ha since polls have opened, but what I can do tell you is that we have about a dozen people casting their ballots. Now, these are the people who were waiting outside this polling station about an hour before polls have even opened. Now, a lot of eyes are 
here on this region, uh, not just because the race is very tight here, but because of the regional significance of Gyeonggi-do province. Now, with its very close proximity to the capital, Seoul, the outcome of the race here will play an influential and important role in the central government. Gyeonggi-do also covers a large area, being the most populated province, with about 12 million residents and nearly 10 million eligible voters. Also, this year, more attention is on how citizens will vote here because this province is actually home to the many families affected by the Seoul fair disaster. The city of Ansan, or the location of Tanwan High School, the school that lost more than 200 students and teachers from the ferry accident, is in Gyeonggi-do province. So people who are disappointed with the ruling party's handling of the situation, there are predictions that they might vote for the other party for governor. Mark? Yes, Connie, the ferry disaster is still high on voters' minds. Uh, surely be a variable in this election, and particularly in Gyeonggi-do province, for the reasons you just mentioned there. So we are expecting a tight race. Tell us more about the two candidates. It's a very tight race. The two candidates are basically neck and neck. Um, ruling Senduri Party candidate Nam Gyeong Pil um, versus a new um, a Politics Alliance for a Democracy candidate Kim Jin Pyo. Now, in a recent poll by Media Research, Nam had a slight um, had a voter approval rating of 40.2 percent, which is just slightly higher than Kim's approval rating with 39.4 percent. And you know, before the Seoul ferry disaster, opinion polls show that. Nam did have a clear edge over Kim, but after the incident, you know, Mark, that voter sentiment has clearly changed. Reporting live from Suwon in Gyeonggi-do province, this has been Connie Lee. Thank you very much, Connie. Now, for a more detailed look at the other key races and those races taking place at these June 4th local elections, our Jim Young-gil has this report. More than 3,500 local government positions are up for grabs, and political parties are making last-ditch efforts to earn voter support on election day. The latest poll showed the ruling Henry Party had the upper hand in six regions. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy was ahead in five regions, and in four regions, the rival parties were neck and neck. When looking at hotly contested regions, incumbent Seoul Mayor Park won sun was in a comfortable lead by more than 18 percentage points against his ruling Henry Party rival Chung mong jun In the port city of Incheon, incumbent Mayor Song Young-gil was in a tight race with his conservative counterpart Yoo Jong-bok with only a 3.2 percentage point difference. For the governor's seat in Gyeonggi-do province, the Senduri Party's Nam Gyeong Pil was in a slight lead with 36 percent, while the main opposition MPAD's Kim Jin Pyo earned 34.7 percent. In the ruling party's stronghold of the southern port city of Busan, independent Oh go Don was in a heated race with Senduri Party candidate Seo byung Su, And in the liberals' power base of the city of Gwangju, independent Kang Un tae trailed 1.1 percentage points behind the MPAD's Yoon Jang Hyun. Political analysts say the reason behind a jump in support for independent candidates is because the two cities feel the necessity to implement some sort of checks and balances system. So the people of Busan, you know, they've been electing the uh, Senuri candidate in every presidential election in the past, and they feel as if that even uh, despite their uh, consistent support, the uh, the presidents in the past from the Senri party haven't really done enough for their region. And also pretty much the same thing in, in Gwangju. Wednesday's local election is also being seen as a midterm evaluation of President Park Geun-hye's administration in the wake of April's ferry disaster. Jim young Arirang News. Now, in almost all recent elections in Korea, swing voters have been uh, deciding the fate of the candidates. Today's local elections are no exception. Experts say voters in their 40s will most likely hold the key to who comes out of the day victorious. Uh, now, Young Young reports. It's become an established fact in Korea that those in their 50s and older tend to support the conservatives, while people in their 30s and younger lean toward liberal parties. That usually leaves people in their 40s making up most of the swing votes. Experts say the Park Geun-hye administration's handling of the Seoul-ho ferry disaster has changed today's election dynamics in many ways. 
Swing voters who saw Prime Minister nominee Ande He withdraw his nomination due to personal ethical issues felt the government was not trustworthy. If a lot of those voters head to the polls, they will likely sway the election results. But it's not just the ruling party that's being hurt. There is bound to be a so-called incumbent advantage because the campaign came to a halt for a few weeks due to the ferry disaster. That made it very difficult for challenging candidates to establish their positions. As for the roughly 12 percent of the electorate who came out for last week's two-day early voting, most experts say it's unlikely that this will pump up the turnout. If people take Thursday off, they can go on a long holiday because Memorial Day falls on Friday. So I think those who participated in the early voting are probably people who were going to vote anyway, but can't because of their schedule, meaning there won't be a drastic increase in the overall voter turnout. All that remains now is to see how many people head to the polls and for their ballots to be counted. Na Hyun-kyung, Arirang News. So whatever happens in these elections, the results are going to have a significant impact on Korea's political landscape over the coming months. They could also be a good indicator of what we can expect at the next presidential race, our Park ji -won reports. The results of the June 4th local elections will significantly change the political landscape of Korea. If the ruling camp wins the election, despite harsh public criticism against the incumbent government following its poor handling of the ferry disaster, the Park Geun-hye administration could gain enough political momentum to steer the state affairs for the rest of her term. The government's ambitious policy goals, which include deregulation reforms and a three-year plan for economic innovation, may also gain political support. However, if the ruling Senate Party loses to opposition camps, not only in its traditionally weak regions, but also in regions where neck and neck races are expected, the Conservative Party will be in a turmoil starting from an upcoming party convention scheduled in July. Politicians inside the party who are close to President Park will most likely be held responsible. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy will also face diverging scenarios according to the results of the elections. If it wins the elections, the late March merger of the former main opposition Democratic Party and political icon An Chol-su's new political vision party will gain the justification it so desperately needs. The co-leadership of Kim Han-gil and An chol su will be strengthened in preparing for the next general elections and eventually the next presidential election. But in the case that the main opposition loses in major neck-and-neck -neck race regions, the co-leadership will be significantly hurt and the fledgling party could face the danger of being embroiled in factional strife. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, for the first time ever, a U.S. official has spoken publicly about Washington's desire to deploy a U.S. missile defense system in South Korea. It remains to be seen whether the move is to counter North Korea, China or both. Kim Young bin reports. The top commander for U.S. forces in Korea has asked Washington to deploy an advanced American missile defense system in Korea, a move that may push Seoul closer to joining Washington's missile defense system along with Japan. Speaking at a lecture in Seoul on Tuesday, General Curtis Caparati said he had recommended that the Pentagon set up the system known as a Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, to Korea. Scaparati's comments are the first from a U.S. official that confirm it is looking into deploying its high altitude defense shield on the peninsula. THAAD is a U.S.-led missile defense system capable of intercepting ballistic missiles at high altitudes of up to 150 kilometers in their terminal phase. Earlier reports said that Washington had conducted a site survey for possible deployment locations for the THAAD system. But is it a good fit for South Korea? 
saw this very controversial regarding the efficiency and adaptability and interoperability. A lot of concepts we should consider. Some experts say the U.S. is not using the system to prevent threats from Pyongyang, but rather to counter China's growing presence in the region. It's still too early to say that uh, China is all against the Chinese rising military power. We should uh, focus on North Korea's direct missile system and its uh, North Korea's very provocative actions, including the forced nuclear test and another missile, uh, another series of. Uh, Test. The recommendation is in the initial stages of consideration. General Scott Barati said a final decision will come after close discussions between Korea and the U.S. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. South Korea repatriated a North Korean fisherman through the Chus village of Panmunjom on Tuesday, three days after he was picked up in a boat drifting off South Korea's eastern coast. The man in his 30s was among three men found on the fishing vessel. The two others said they wanted to stay in the South, and Seoul's Unification Ministry said it will honour their request based on humanitarian grounds. Pyongyang had been demanding that all three men be repatriated. It seems another wrinkle has been added to the already strained relations between Korea and Japan over Tokyo's continued territorial claims to the Korea-controlled Dokdo Island in the East Sea. The Japanese government says it will send a senior official to a gathering in Tokyo Thursday that will support Japan's attempts to lay claim to Dokdo, which is called Takashima in Japan. The Minister of State for Okinawa and the Northern Territories Affairs, Ichita Yamamoto, said Tuesday that Deputy Cabinet Member and Member of the House of Representatives in the Diet, Mazazumi Gotouda, will attend the event. Gotouda is ranked higher than vice ministers of government departments. Minister Yamamoto says the government was trying hard to find an effective way to express Tokyo's position on the Dokdo issue and found that this was their final decision. Samsung Everland, the de facto holding company of Samsung Group, says it plans to go public in the first quarter of next year. It's being seen as a move to speed up the succession of ownership from the group's chairman to his children. Our Huang Jie has this report. Samsung Everland will go public by next March. The de facto holding company of Korea's biggest conglomerate, Samsung, said Tuesday that it plans an initial public offering as part of efforts to become a global fashion and service company. The move, however, is widely seen by analysts as the next step in the conglomerate's succession plan as it relates to Samsung Electronics chairman Lee Gong Yi's three children. Currently, his son Taeyong holds the largest 25% stake in Samsung Everland, while his two daughters, Pujin and Seohyun, each hold around an 8.5% stake. Chairman Yi holds a mere 3.7%. Analysts say the listing of Samsung Everland will give the chairman's children means to generate cash by selling shares in the company. The cash could be used to help pay inheritance taxes and buy shares in companies they want to control. Samsung Group would need a lot of transaction costs in order to pay you know, necessary taxes, in order to swap uh, necessary uh, stakes from one entity to the other. Questions linger about Samsung's future as the group's de facto chairman Lee Gong-hee was hospitalized last month after suffering a heart attack. Many predict that the electronics and financial sector will be handed over to Yi's only son Taeyong, the chemical and hotel sectors to first daughter Pujin, and the fashion and media sectors to second daughters Hoi-hun. Samsung Everland is expected to lay out a detailed schedule and procedures for the listing later this month. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, Korea has been placed a lowly 90th out of 138 countries when it comes to people who say they are living happy lives. U.S.-based Gallup says Korea scored 63 according to its index, uh, which is the same figure as the Czech Republic, Iran, Luxembourg and Kazakhstan. Except for Denmark, the top 10 countries were from South and Central America. Paraguay topped the list for the third straight year, followed by Panama. Gallup asked the respondents questions like, did you feel respected yesterday and did you have plenty of rest yesterday? And if they said yes, they added points. In each country, the agency asked 1,000 residents over the age of 15.
Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this uh, Wednesday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by the news center. Good morning to you, Eunice. Hi, Mark. We have some global election news to kick us off this morning. At this hour, presidential polls are closing in war-torn Syria, where only citizens in state-controlled regions were able to cast their ballots. The polls excluded rebel-held rebel parts of Syria's north and east. President Bashar al-Assad, who is running against two relatively unknown challengers, is expected to win a third seven-year term in office. The state has said the vote is a sign that the country is moving forward as it takes place under a new constitution, but his opponents and world governments are calling the election, quote, a grotesque parody and a sham. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had urged Damascus not to hold the polls amid a three-year civil war that has killed some 150-thousand people and displaced 42 percent of Syrians. Insurgents stepped up attacks in the build-up to the election. 28 people are said to have died on voting day. And over in Egypt, its former military chief, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, has been declared the country's next president, officially replacing the Islamist leader he deposed last year. Its election commission announced el-Sisi won with nearly 97 percent of the vote against the 3.9 percent his leftist opponent received. Voter turnout was at 47 percent. Hundreds of people took to Cairo's Tahrir Square to celebrate, dancing and setting off fireworks, while opponent Hamdine Sabahi conceded defeat. He alleged the vote wasn't without irregularities, saying some of his campaign staff were detained and members of El Sisi's camp were allowed inside polling stations. Beijing is speaking out, defending its detention of government critics ahead of today's anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown as lawful. Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei on Tuesday said there are only lawbreakers and no so-called dissidents in China and that its legal authority should be respected. Dozens of activists have been detained or placed under house arrest, according to human rights groups. Today marks the 25-year anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, the bloody crackdown against pro-democracy student activists at Beijing Center. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the PGA this time as golfers have been trying to qualify for the upcoming U.S. Open. And for two Korean golfers, they got the ticket they need. Now with the regional qualifying rounds coming to an end, two South Korean golfers have qualified for the major as No sung Yar and Kim Young-sung will be competing in the big event next week after qualifying in their regional event. Meanwhile, Chae kyung Ju, a.k.a. KJ Choi, will not be competing in the event next week after failing to qualify, ending his 48th straight major qualification. And now moving over to some Tuesday night's KBO action where a few games were canceled due to rain, but the NC Dinos beat the Nexon Heroes 5-3 thanks to Eric Thames and his second Grand Slam of the season. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the battle between the two big cats, the Samsung Lions taking on the Kia Tigers. Now, of course, going into the game here, second inning, Lee Ji Young flies out to right, tagging up his Lee Sun Yup, and it's 1 0 Samsung. We go over to the fourth inning of the game, Paki Nam, sack fly to left, Naji Wan would score here, and we're tied 1 to 1. Fifth inning, another sack fly, this time from Chete In to center field, and Samsung has the lead 2 to 1. Now, Samsung gets more insurance run here thanks to Pak Kani and his RBI ground out to second base. Meanwhile, Samsung's Yoon Sung Wan pitching a brilliant game here, throwing six and two thirds inning, striking out seven while giving up just one run as the Samsung Lions win this game four to one. And now finishing things off in the UFC, where the president of UFC, Dana White, has come out in an interview recently and talked about Korea's chances at hosting their first UFC event. Now, according to Dana White, he's 100 percent sure that the biggest mixed martial arts competition will come to Korea, as he added that he's been impressed with how much the sport is loved here in the nation. He acknowledged that the market for UFC is huge in Korea and plans to hold the event in the near future. Meanwhile, Mexico will hold their first UFC event in November. 
And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, due to lingering rain clouds, southern regions will receive spread showers during the day, while the rest of the country will have mostly to partly cloudy day. And other than Seoul metro area, rest of the regions will continue to have cooler readings, highs hovering in the low to uh, mid-20s across the region. So let's take a closer look at those numbers. The high in the capital will rise to 28, while Daewoo and Busan tops out at 22, and Gwangju should climb to 20. Now, for other regions, down on Jeju uh, should see a high of 25. Daejeon and Dokdo will reach 27 and 22. That's all for now. Back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Gion. Those are the stories we have for you this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about half an hour's time. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.